doesn't swim. It 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 Good afternoon, everyone. So nice, so many friends in the room. So you've met the Magnificent Seven. You probably heard last night about the Lone Ranger. So I guess that makes us the three amigos. <laughs> My name is Heidi Allen, and I am very, very proud to be the Member of Parliament for South Cambridgeshire. I love my constituency. It is bursting with innovation and a desire to challenge the status quo. I love that my constituents want to share their talents and their discoveries to make the world a better place and to tackle inequalities. My constituents make my head and my heart fizz with possibilities. I want to feel that way in Westminster too. I am tired of feeling numb. So today, alongside my wonderful colleagues, I have resigned from the Conservative Party. It was the Tottenham riots in 2011 that stimulated my change in career. I was busy running my own manufacturing business. I had no political interest whatsoever, and I never even thought about joining a political party. But watching the news night after night, it was as if Lord Kitchener was pointing his finger out of the screen at me. Your country needs you. That raw hunger to serve my country and to offer my skills and experience led me to the Conservative Party. I believed that under David Cameron and his big society, the party like me was ambitious for the country. It was challenging the nasty party image and proving that we could in fact be a party of both competence and compassion. So why, so often, too often, in the last three years, have I found myself going over the top fighting for benevolence in our welfare system. The Department for Work and Pensions has had six Secretaries of State in three years. Six. You wouldn't run a business like that and expect it to succeed. So how can it possibly be acceptable when you are completely redesigning our welfare safety net? 
particularly when that net is so vital, when we are at our lowest and when we need it most. Because those that rely on the net are people and not numbers. I shouldn't have to feel that the only option left open to me is to take a camera crew around the country to shine a devastating spotlight on poverty. It shouldn't be this hard. I believed I was part of a party who worked collaboratively, welcomed knowledge, and had the empathy to feel. But I have slowly but surely realized that I am not. I can no longer represent a government and a party who can't open their eyes to the suffering endured by the most vulnerable in society. Suffering which we have deepened whilst having the power to fix. The Conservatives were always recognised as the party of economic competence. But when we allowed a Cabinet Minister to say F business, and we have a Prime Minister bullied into submission by the ERG, and is now dragging the country and Parliament, kicking and screaming to the edge of a no-deal abyss, I'm done. I want to be part of something better, a party that people vote for because they want to, not because they feel they have to. But this afternoon I feel a mix of emotions, apprehension, some sadness. I do worry about my relationships with good friends I've made in the Conservative Party. They know who they are. But do you know what I also feel, ladies and gentlemen? I feel excited so excited and in a way that I haven't felt since I was first elected and a sense of liberation because the United Kingdom deserves better I didn't leave my business to lower my professional standards and accept second best I demand more from my party and more for my country more competence more collaboration more expert analysis more transparency more care and more fairness it needs to push and shove and drive, not cower from its own shadow. It should attract the best minds, the biggest hearts, and the most effective communicators. I, we, are prepared to dare to dream that this could be possible. But it's not going to happen if we sit idly by, nodding through policy and voting like sheep. If Brexit was a pained clarion call for change, then we hear it. Our parties have been unable to grasp the magnitude of the challenge and have no plan to respond nor heal the divisions across our cities, our villages and our dining tables. So we need to start again with a clean sheet. And as true centre ground MPs sharing the same values as millions of our citizens, we have a responsibility to act. This week is the beginning. Once there were seven and now there are eleven. And at the last count, about 115,000 Twitter followers. So yes, we are putting our heads above the parapet, and we might fail. But isn't the prize worth fighting for? And I sense the country wants us to fight for it too. And I, for one, am prepared to give it everything I've got. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to my very good friend, Dr. Sarah Wollaston. I'll follow that. Um, I'm not going to talk for long. I just think that it's with great sadness that I'm leaving the Conservative Party today. And I think there are three questions. Uh, why? Why now? And what next? So first for the why, I have to ask myself, would I have joined the party in 2009 and sat to be the first ever candidate selected by a full open postal primary in my Totnes constituency? if the party had looked then as it has become today? And the answer is no. And I ask myself, if I wouldn't stand to be a Conservative MP, if I wouldn't encourage others to vote Conservative in a general election, then how can I possibly continue with the Conservative whip? And this is about more than Brexit. Um, I joined the party after spending 24 years as a frontline doctor in the NHS wanting to make a difference, joining a tolerant, moderate, open-hearted Conservative Party, which I think has now disappeared. I'm afraid the Prime Minister simply hasn't delivered on the pledge she made on the steps of Downing Street to tackle the burning injustices in our society. 
And I think that what we now see is that the party that was once the most trusted on the economy and on business is now marching us towards the cliff edge of a no-deal Brexit. I've been saying for weeks that if it became main party policy to deliver no deal, um, then I would have to leave. But I'm afraid there comes a point when running down the clock is in effect the same thing. And none of us are prepared to wait until our toes are at the cliff edge before we take a stand. And before we are prepared to say, if necessary, putting our careers on the line, to say, please change your mind, Prime Minister. This is not a binary choice between no deal and a poor deal. There is a third way. And that third way is to hand that decision back to the British people, to allow them to look at the evidence, to weigh up the, prospect, the, the, the pros and the cons of the actual Brexit deal, as opposed to the fantasy promises that were, de, were made during the referendum campaign, to allow the public to weigh up the pros and cons and give their valid consent to this deal. Um, so that's why today we're taking a stand and why we're doing it now. And we're proud that we're going to be part of the new independent group of MPs sitting together and hoping to fix our broken politics. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Conservative Party has been very good to me. I've been elected three times to represent the people of Broxtow as their Member of Parliament. And I'm very grateful for the support and the hard work of a small team of activists, mostly members of Broxtow Conservatives, they know who they are, friends and family who enabled me to win. I served in two governments as a Minister of Health, the first woman MP Defence Minister, and in 2015, I was promoted to attend Cabinet as Business Minister. I rejoined the party in 2002 to a welcome that warmed as the desperately needed modernisation of the Conservatives took shape. I was a single mother of two children. I'd worked in television as a reporter and a presenter, and then spent 16 years as a criminal barrister in my home city of Nottingham. You don't leave a political party that you've called home for many years without a great deal of thought and a considerable amount of heartache. And it is with a heavy heart that I have today resigned my membership of the Conservative Party. Last night, an old friend who I first met back in the 1970s, I can't tell you which year because it's so long ago I've forgotten, but in any event, we were both student members of Birmingham University Conservatives, and he sent me a text. Don't leave, he said. Stay and fight them. It's our party, not theirs. He, like my many friends in the parliamentary party, is a one-nation Tory from the Ken Clark wing of the Tory party. The them of which he spoke are the right, the anti-EU wing of the Conservative Party. Yesterday, Sir John Major spoke about them describing the more extreme of their number as zealots. He's called them far worse, but he correctly identified the hollowing out of traditional Tories in the membership of the Conservative Party. Well, as my friend, and he is my friend, Chukaramuna said on Monday, you don't join a political party to fight it, and you don't stay in it and skirmish in the margins when the truth is the battle is over, and the other side has won. The right wing, the hardline anti-EU awkward squad that have destroyed every leader for the last 40 years are now running the Conservative Party from top to toe. They are the Conservative Party. Dear friends, and they are dear friends, now former colleagues who share those one nation values and principles will of course today deny it but I believe in their heads and in their hearts, they know it's over. And the reason they know it's over is because we lost the referendum and Brexit now defines and shapes the Conservative Party. Now, I'm a former criminal barrister, so I'm pretty much predisposed to evidence. And it's on the evidence that I say the Conservative Party is in the state it's in 
and I suggest that evidence is overwhelming. After the Prime Minister lost her withdrawal agreement, she said she would reach out to build a consensus. Of course, she should have done that at the beginning of all of this, at her, in the beginning of her premiership, not at the 11th hour. And in that spirit, the first people that she invited into number 10 were the ERG, the very people who just weeks beforehand had called a vote of no confidence in her leadership and had delighted in calling out her failings to any passing microphone on College Green. But mainstream conservatives with a fine record of loyalty who'd served at the highest level in government, and I hope she'll forgive me for using her name, but people like Justin Greening, who'd rejected the deal for perfectly sensible reasons, are still waiting for a call. At a local level, and I don't include my association in this, though we have had our problems with infiltration, but overwhelmingly, the majority of associations are being infiltrated by a nationally orchestrated entryism, blatantly designed to remove rebel MPs who they label traitors. Conservatives with the stature, the service and loyalty of Sir Nicholas Soames, Sir Oliver Letwin, the former party chair, Dame Caroline Spellman. They're being hounded and they're being pilloried. My friend Nick Bowles, faces deselection, as do others. Some face motions of no confidence, and their only offence has been to support the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. And even though the party chairman is on the traitor's list, he's failed to provide the firm political leadership that is demanded. The result of this blue kip, as Sarah has called it, and what we call the purple momentum, is that too many of our now former colleagues fear their associations more than they fear their electorate, the people they've been voted to represent. It's a form of tyranny. And it's ironic that conservatives observe and condemn it in the Labour Party, but it's happening in their own party. And in the words of my other dear friend and my near neighbour, Chris Leslie, enough is enough. The shift to the right began shortly after Theresa May became leader, and notwithstanding her fine words on the steps of Downing Street, which, as Sarah says, we all three of us cheered, within a few months, the modernising reforms that had taken years to achieve were destroyed. Citizens of the world were cast out as citizens of nowhere. Remain voters marginalised and insulted as members of the liberal metropolitan elite that didn't go down very well in places like Broxtow amongst my Remain voters. And of course, the electorate gave their verdict in June 2017 when we lost over 30 Conservative MP colleagues in a truly disastrous general election campaign. And where are we now? Well, we're with EU citizens who've lived and contributed to this country for decades, being labelled as queue jumpers. One Nation Conservatives are pursuing a Brexit policy they don't believe in, and they know it will harm the economic prospects of this remarkable country and their own constituents. Others, like Sir John Major, bravely battle on, making the point that 63% of people in this country did not vote for Brexit, and even more did not vote for the no-deal Brexit that, unfortunately, Mrs May appears willing to deliver. But the decision to leave the Conservatives, as Heidi and Sarah has, have identified, is not all about Brexit. It's about facing the reality of British politics as it stands today and is set to continue unless we do our duty as elected representatives. You win in politics when you're with a team and in that team with shared values and principles. And I believe mine are no longer welcome in the Conservative Party. I'm not leaving the Conservative Party. It's left us. On Monday, Chuka held out the baton to people like us, and today we seize it, and in turn, we hold it out to fellow One Nation Conservatives and like-minded Lib Dems that I certainly had the pleasure to work with in the coalition government. Please come and join us. 
and to the millions of people who feel abandoned and not represented by either of our two broken main parties and indeed all our parties. We share your values, your dreams and your aspirations. We three have uh, never been called your so-called typical Tory. <laughs> like everyone, we're tired of labels, we're tired of tribalism and we're tired of British politics being dominated from its extremes. It's time for change and we are a team with your support that will deliver that change. Thank you. Thanks, team. Um, I'm, I, my job is to take the questions in the sense that I will uh, MC them. Uh, and Heidi and Sarah will take the majority. Going to answer them all. If anybody's, you, you know what it's like, when, I'm not great at these press conferences, but I try my best. <laughs> Carolyn. I suppose from the way I look at it is, yes, I mean, you know, everybody here knows what Westminster's like, and it's, it's conversations in corridors and people scuttle around. Because our two parties, particularly, but I'd say all of them, you're suppressed. So having the courage to do what you know is right is hard. But are there a number of colleagues in all parties who are keen to join us? Absolutely. But everybody has to get there in their own time. You know, we had no idea that Chucker and the team were going to, as they say, pick up the baton on Monday. Um, but it felt right for us to pick it up on Wednesday. So I think everybody will get there in their own time. But yes, we do believe there are a significant number of colleagues. Sarah, do you want to add anything? I think it's for those colleagues to speak for themselves rather than for us yeah. to, to name them. But certainly there are a number of our colleagues who are deeply unhappy uh, and particularly deeply unhappy about no deal Brexit. And I, what I would hope is that ministers will have the courage of their convictions to actually step down from their posts. Um, I'm not necessarily expecting them to join us here, but we do expect people to really stand up for what they know is right for this country and not allow no deal to go ahead. And nobody knew until 7 o'clock, I think it was last night, that Joan was going to come and join us. And we're deeply grateful <laughs> yes, for that, Joan. Nick, what? I'm, going to, I'm just going to go down the line. But, guys, there's a, there's a microphone. Oh, you've got it. I've got it. <laughs> That's very naughty. Go on, give it to me. Uh, Nick, what? BBC News 9. Um, Anna Soubry, a few months ago, uh, you said to me that Theresa May should sling the Brexiteers out of the Conservative Party. But today, the three of you have slung yourselves out of the Conservative Party. So do you and those remaining One Nation Tories in the Conservative Party, have you comprehensively lost that battle? And in aligning yourself with this new group, are you appealing to all voters, however they voted in the Brexit referendum, or are you only appealing to those voters who believe that referendum result was a big mistake? No, I think we are absolutely appealing to everybody. I mean, there's no debate about that at all. And at some stage when this nightmare, and it is a nightmare, Brexit, when it, what, in, and in whatever form it ends up in, this country has a huge job to do, which is to heal these enormous divides. And, and one of the frustrations that we have is that none of that work has been done by this government in the over two and a half years as it now is since the referendum. Absolutely nothing has been done, and not just to heal the divide, but actually to look at the causes of Brexit as well. And you talk about the fight, Nick, and I'm... I'm, I'm you know, I was involved in the fight when I was a student politician, and it's a bit like Groundhog Day, a lot of this. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we won it back, and under Cameron, we saw this great modernisation that brought people like Sarah in and then brought Heidi in. And it's all been thrown away. Uh, and, you know, the, the simple truth of it is, as I thought I'd outlined, you know, that the party now is in the grip of the ERG, and it's shifted to the right, and it continues to carry on. And we've seen that, we saw it only the other week, with the move to interfere with foreign aid, overseas aid development work, and the commitment to 0.0%. It's begun, and it will keep on going, because the Prime Minister is in hock to them, absolutely in hock to them. Yes, sorry. Paul Brand, ITV Sorry, News. Paul. You're all colleagues in ITV as well. I know. Um, don't questions. say that, we get into terrible trouble. You'll get terrible hate mail now, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, I said co I, colleagues, not, not necessarily 
friends and allies. Um, <laughs> and so just, it begins. I'm, I'm just defending my impartiality. It's John Pienaar next. <laughs> yeah. Go um, on, sorry, Paul. Two questions. Firstly, having left the Conservative Party, don't you now make it more likely that Theresa May will tack to the right, no. try to woo those Brexit-supporting MPs in her party, and deliver the hard Brexit that you all fear? And secondly, Anna Subri, you have said in the past that Jeremy Corbyn is a greater danger to Britain than Brexit. Are you really willing to vote with him now on a case-by-case -case basis in Parliament as independents, potentially strengthen his hand by attacking the Conservatives? Heidi, do you want to do the first one first? Yeah. Um, so on the point about um, will it make the Prime Minister's attack get further to the right, um, and all these things, of course, we've given great consideration to, because this is a big thing to do, huge. And you need to be very careful. You know, this isn't about us. It's about what we think is the best outcome for the country. And what we are hoping, you know, we'd run out of ammunition. There was no other conversation, no other persuasion, no other amendment. <laughs> there was nothing else we had left in our pockets. And this is in part designed to be a wake-up call because her majority is now less than it was. She knows the party is full of people that feel the way that we do, so she will have to finally, once and for all, we believe, see the ERG off because otherwise this is a taste of more to come. Sarah, do you want to like something? All I would say is instead of constantly reaching out to the ERG and the DUP, I would say we are now a, a bigger mm. grouping than the DUP. And that if she wants to get her deal through, she could get it through by making it conditional on a second vote. referendum to confirm it. And, and so we will all be supporting Peter Carl's amendment. Um, and I hope that the Prime Minister will see that that is the best way to get her deal through, uh, to make it conditional on the consent of the British people. And, and, and to answer your question, of course, this doesn't change any of the votes in Parliament on Brexit. Those votes remain absolutely the same. So it, it really doesn't change the arithmetic in Parliament in that respect because we will continue, well, we won't be re rebelling anymore, we will be with our new friends, uh, and we will be following... Well, they're disappointing not to be rebels anymore. But, um. <laughs> what do you mean, vote for Jeremy Corbyn? Well, we, we, we do vote. Look, hang on a moment. You know as well as anybody else. Of course there are times when we all come together and we all vote together. But, so nothing has changed in that respect at all. John? Could I ask, why do you believe that such a small handful of MPs can really transform politics in the way that you say. And if I may, is a new party part of your plans? And if it is, do you accept that the odds and the political system are heavily against you succeeding? Heidi. Um, in whatever order, yes, 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 and yes. They are against us. But you know what? We've got to try. We have got to try. It's so easy in this job to nod, go through the lobby, read your briefing, do as you're told. But that's not living. That's not representing people. That's not having this most important job to take responsibility very, very seriously. If we don't try, we are surrendering our country, and frankly, we don't deserve the job that we have. So if, if, we, if we have to be the ones that go over the top, then so be it. But this is the right thing. It's not about numbers. Mm -hmm. so, Sarah? And these are early days. Um, we, we are not a political party. We came together um, with uh, recognizing that we share values and that over the coming weeks and months we'll be having conversations and most importantly reaching out to the country to see what they would like from a new moderate center ground party. Um, so those are conversations that need to take place. It's very early days, but as Heidi has said and you have said, we know the odds are stacked against us, but we're determined to try. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Lewis Gore from uh, Sky News. I'm very struck that all of you have criticised the Prime Minister in quite visceral terms personally. How far do you think she is responsible for the rot in the Conservative Party at the moment? If she behaved differently, might you still be in the party? And secondly, if the government is as bad as you say it is, you both all described, I think, um, that it's entrenched poverty in this country, making poverty worse. Why did you vote for it only a few weeks ago in a no-confidence motion? And if there were going to be a new, another no-confidence motion, how would you vote in that motion? I would say two things. First of all, the Prime Minister had the opportunity, which she should have grasped as soon as she became leader, to reunite our country and to go for that soft, sensible Brexit, doing the right thing by the British economy and the right thing by the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. She had that opportunity and she didn't do it. She should have reached out, frankly, over the heads of the Labour front bench and she should have built a consensus in Parliament. She positively chose not to do it. Instead, she put down red lines. She had a second opportunity after the general election, which we lost, as I described. And again, she didn't use that opportunity to, re to rub out the red lines to build a consensus. Um, and those have been two 
very serious failings on her part, and we've ended up now in this terrible mess where we've just, what, how many hours was it, 900 at hours? 11, at 11 o'clock this morning, it was 900 hours to, uh, to Brexit. Mm -hmm. And look at the mess we're in. And, and, uh, if there were another no-confidence motion, would it be guaranteed you the might not vote for the thing, government? The, the reason that we supported and voted in favour of this government continuing is because the last thing that this country wants or needs is a general election. The thing that this country does need is a people's vote on Brexit because it is the only way through the mess to take it back to the British people. That's the only thing that we need. I didn't know if Sarah wanted... Are you all right? Well, I just think it's a, a great pity that the only red line that wasn't put down was the red line over the cliff. And we feel very strongly that no responsible government could or should inflict the kind of pain and harm that they know would be inflicted by that option. So, so we're, we're deeply disappointed that there's been red lines everywhere except where it should have been. Theo. Um, can I just ask to, to each of you, uh, did anybody within the party try and persuade you to stay within the party, either the chairman, Brandon Lewis, or the prime minister, Theresa May? And just supposing, in your view, Brexit does go well, could you foresee circumstances where you might apply, reapply to join the Conservative Party? No and no. Um, I had one cabinet minister drop me a text last night, because um, you guys were just putting it out there a bit soon, to be honest. <laughs> um, and the rumours were rife, um, who um, tried to convince me not to. But nothing from the Prime Minister, the Chief Whip, my own whip, nothing at all. Um, and no, I would not rejoin the Tory party. Mm -hmm. Um, all I would say is I have many wonderful friends in the Conservative Party and many of them have sent me very supportive messages yeah. asking us not to, not to leave. Yeah. Um, but I've had no contact from the Prime Minister's office um, and, and none from the Whip's office either. So I don't think any effort has ever been made to reach out to those of us who are in the moderate centre ground of the party. Right, I'm being strictly told five minutes. Go on, Andy, sorry. Um, Andy Bell, Five News. Wouldn't the honourable thing be now, though, to resign and fight by elections, all of you? And after all, if you think the country is crying out for this, wouldn't a victory be the most extraordinary validation of what you've all been doing? I suppose from my point of view, I mean, Anna's already touched on this partly in terms of the last thing the country needs right now is a general election or any kind of by-election. I agree with that. But I think the other two points, um, you know, as Anna eloquently put, we haven't changed <laughs> what we stood on on our values, our own leaflets, our own campaigning when we stood in 2017, none of that has changed. There are big chunks of the manifesto that haven't been delivered, but everything that we promised hasn't changed. But the other big thing that people need to remember, this is what the big parties do. Mm -hmm. yes. They want to crush the birth of democracy. They want to crush people like us trying to change things for this country. And this is the game, of course, that they will play. But we're better than that, and we think our constituents in the country deserve better than that. Right, Gary at the back. Not at the back. We're going to go down this line. Thank you very much. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News. You, you each of you talked a bit about uh, the things you thought were wrong with the Tory party and suggesting that it, it had gone bad very recently. Uh, there'll be a lot of people, Labour MPs included, who are thinking of joining this group who actually think the Tory party did a lot of bad things for a lot of years and they would include in that welfare changes, austerity. Do you regret a lot of that, or is that what you define as economic competence? I, I believe that we did the right thing in the coalition government in particular. I think the coalition government, which I served in, um, did a, a marvellous job. And one of the reasons it did that is because it was two parties working together. And the mis one of the mistakes that David Cameron made, and he made many, but he had the opportunity in that time between 2010 and 2015 basically to see off this right wing, this anti-EU group of people who'd bedeviled the party, as I say, for decades, and reach out to those members of the Lib Dems who clearly were, if you like, orange Tories, but who shared, again, same principles, the same values. And that was a mistake. We should have, we should have used that opportunity. And for sure, we wouldn't have found ourselves up in the position whereby we put in a manifesto that we would have an EU referendum in order to satisfy this right-wing extreme in our party. And, the George and Osborne Chancellorship a good thing. Sorry? Uh, the George Osborne Chancellorship was a good thing. My view is that uh, Osborne... A lot of people thinking of joining this gap. No, 
I, I, have to, the other I have to say, I think the things that we did to the economy were absolutely necessary at the time. I don't have a problem with that. But the I think there, there, were, there, there have been um, difficulties, and I would say, and as I've said in the House of Commons, I think that certainly for local government, the, who bear so many of the cuts, certainly my county of Nottinghamshire finds it, which is run by Tories, uh, and is very competent, has found it, find itself in a position now where if it doesn't get more money, it will go into a dangerous deficit. And isn't it extraordinary, just at the point where we can start to reverse austerity and really get to grips with some of the inequalities to reduce those, um, we are knowingly and deliberately possibly sending ourselves back into a, an economic downturn, you know, depriving us of the opportunity to make progress. So I think it's absolutely extraordinary that any Conservative government would even contemplate that. Right, where, I don't know where to go. Oh, who's got the microphone? I think that's the easiest way, isn't it? That's very bad. Hi, uh, William James from Reuters. You said yourself earlier that you can't change the arithmetic in Parliament. So as a 3 or as an 11, what can you actually change? Well, when I say, I mean, when I, I think what I said was the arithmetic won't change because we've left the Tory party and we will still vote in the way that we were always going to vote on Brexit. I'm hoping that this will really concentrate some minds of colleagues in the, in the Conservative Party that we know share our concerns and also share our values and our principles and are very unhappy about the direction of travel. I think the other thing that I would say is this. I also hope it gives courage to members of the government who are deeply concerned about this no deal becoming a real, a real possibility. And it will give them the courage next week to do what, frankly, some of them should have done a long time ago and be true to what they believe. And if they need to leave government and vote against the party line on Brexit, they've got to do it. Because, frankly, if we have the... Yeah, we have got the courage to do this. They, they come and follow that. You know, see, see it, grasp it, do the right thing by your country and start putting the national interest first. Um, I'm so sorry, I don't know your name at the front. I'm, very, I'm hopeless at names. Yeah, no, Ross Kempsell from Talk Radio and Talk Sports. What is your personal message, each of you, to the Prime Minister? You've written her a letter but you are very aware of the political challenges that she faces. Many of you, uh, apart from on the issue of Brexit, have been very sympathetic with her across other policy. What do you say to her as a fellow parliamentarian, a fellow MP, a fellow Conservative, although you're now former Conservatives, facing the challenges that she faces? Sir, do not take us over the cliff. Um, reach out to the moderates that are left in your party or you'll lose those two. Anybody else? Actually, I've not been over here. A woman. Sorry, that is... But it is important. <laughs> Have you noticed? Is it 65% sugar? Two-thirds. Two Two-thirds of, of us are women. Yeah, yeah. 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 that oh, says a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's Hannah Rothman from BuzzFeed News. I've got one question um, for all of you and one just for you, Anna. You mentioned entryism. Who are these people? Where are they coming from? And how many of them are there? And just for all of you, how close do you think Tory colleagues are to joining you? Can I suggest the entries on question is perhaps best answered by Sarah, because you've had it particularly yes. um, well, strong in your constituency. You can just see for yourselves the very aggressive and well-funded social media campaign that has been waged against many of us, um, describing us as traitors, all sorts of language. And the trouble is that that kind of language it has consequences. It has consequences not only in the, 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 the threats that we receive, the deluge of, of uh, a really threatening calls that our staff have to deal with. Uh, it's, it's really horrible. But it does mean that our associations are changing. And as I've said about my colleagues in Parliament, I have many, many friends in my local association. And none of this is a, is a reflection on the executive of my association. Um, and, and I have many friends, but it's very clear to me that our associations are changing. And increasingly, actually what we're having is people who are quite clearly UKIP members, and they are changing the associations yeah. and turning the Tory party into a blue kip, as I've described. I, I think, if I may say, if you go on the Leave EU Facebook page, you will see the, the name and shame of traitors with people like Nicholas Soames on it. And then you'll see the blatant join the Conservative Party to deselect and then they name the people. Mm -hmm. Contact us and we will help you join in order not just to deselect, 
members of parliament, but also to take part in what they believe will be in some, I don't know, three, six months or whatever, the leadership election for a new leader. This is the most blatant undermining yeah. of democracy that I actually have, well, it's never happened before in the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. And it means in the real world that we have colleagues, we can't name them, we have colleagues who will not vote in the way that they want to vote because they are frightened of being deselected or in some way admonished by their associations. As I said, they're not frightened of their electorate. There's nothing wrong with that. They're frightened often of zealots, as Sir John Major called them, who are in charge in their associations, and that is not meant to be the way of the Tory party. Gosh, so Can we pick Paul Little Owen? He's been trying quite hard. That'd be sorry? Okay. Owen, he's been trying quite hard. Oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Um, okay. This is creeping, I know. <laughs> go on, go on. Sorry. Sorry. We might need the manor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, obviously, uh, everyone who's joined the independent group shares the same view on Brexit. I wondered if you could think of perhaps two other policies which unite all 11 of you outside of the European issue. God, to be truthful, there are so many. <laughs> I think genuinely tackling the burning injustices. We were all inspired by what the Prime Minister had to say on the steps of Downing Street. And we want to be part of a movement that, a movement that actually delivers that. I mean, I'd, I'd cite the domestic violence. I mean, to be truthful, there's very little, as you probably know, there's not very much going through Parliament. I mean, you all that go down, you will see that this week has been a few statutory instruments and general debates and that's it. But, I mean, just take the domestic violence bill. That's something we all agree on. A widespread support for that. No problem at all, except it doesn't extend, of course, its jurisdiction into Northern Ireland. I wonder why that would be. Because there's a problem, as we know, of abortion, the lack of human rights for women in Northern Ireland, and the only reason that the government has not extended the jurisdiction as it should do is because it's in hock to the DUP. I think if I can just finish on that point, I think the thing that's startling and reflective of real life, actually, and that's why I think, small though we are, we do have a chance of succeeding, that we're just normal people with values. The policy part comes secondary. People first, politicians second. And that how is the vast, you know, you don't talk to your friends in the pub about what do you think about the, uh, the social care policy then? It's, you know, how's your grand doing? Yeah. And, and that's the kind of grouping that we are, and that's been very important. It's literally, you park your, your pre-branding at the door, and we talk about values and what's right, and let's discuss it. And what's very important is we need to bring the British public into that conversation. Well, I think on that note, uh, I'm told in very strict terms that that is it. Thank you very, very much indeed for waiting uh, and for coming along. Uh, thank you very much for coming thank along. You. I think we're giving interviews. Thank you. <laughs>